Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Hello and welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I'm Errol Yabake. I am a senior fellow with our international security program here at CSIS, where I also direct something called the Project on Fragility and Mobility. And today we're here with my friend and world-renowned scholar Prague Hanna to talk about his latest book, Move, um, where it's, it's an incredibly interesting, readable book um, that I would uh, encourage everyone to, to go out and get and, and read immediately. Um, Prague is a leading global, global strategy advisor. He's a world traveler and a best-selling author. He's the founder and managing partner of FutureMap, which is a data and strategy-based, sorry, scenario-based strategic advisory firm. And his newest book, Move, The Forces Uprooting Us, was published last year. And that's what we're here to talk about. Uh, before Move, he's published a slew of very, very interesting books. Uh, Prague, I have to admit, I haven't read every single one of them, um, but I have read enough to where I can say that I can't wait for, for every new one to come out. Um, your last one was The Future is Asian, Commerce, Conflict, and Culture in the 21st Century, which came out in 2019. And I really liked your, your trilogy. I actually got on to, to your scholarship uh, via connect uh, Connectography, which was uh, one of your, your latest in, in 2016, Connectography Mapping the Future of Global Civilization. But that one actually capped a trilogy of your books uh, on sort of the future of the world order. You wrote about uh, your first one back in 20, uh, sorry, 2008 was the second world empires and influence in the new global order. Uh, you followed that up in 2011 with how to run the world, charting a, a course to the next renaissance. And then you concluded that trilogy with that connectography, mapping the future of global civilization. I have that one just over there in my office and, and consult it often. Um, somehow between all of that, uh, Parag found time to write Technocracy in America, Rise of the Info State in 2017, and he co-authored a book called Hybrid Reality, Thriving in the Emerging Human Technology Civilization. So in addition to being just a, a prolific author and thinker, he was named uh, one of Esquire's 75 most influential people of the 21st century and featured in Wire Magazine's Smart List. He uh, holds a PhD from London School of Economics, although I love Parag, how you always introduce yourself as Parag, not Dr. Parag Hanna. Um, I really appreciate that. And, and um, I think it says a lot about your, your character and your accessibility that I think really uh, is, is seen in your books as well. You know, this is written for, not for your peer London School of Economics PhDs, it's written really for, for all of us. Um, you also know a lot about Washington, D.C., uh, having gotten your, your bachelor's and master's degrees from the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. Um, you have uh, traveled to, uh, it's, it says here, nearly 150 countries, which I'm sure uh, is even higher now, and you're a long, young global leader uh, for the, the World Economic Forum. So, Prague, I'm really honored to, to host you here for this book event at CSIS. Um, I have to say, it's you wrote about migration, and you published it during what I guess could be called the Great COVID lockdown, uh, where everyone stopped moving everywhere. So on the surface, that that may seem a bit ironic. Why this book, and and why now? <laughs> Thank you so much, Earl. It's such a pleasure to join you, and it's an honor, uh, really, to uh, to share this digital stage this time, as it were, uh, with you uh, for the distinguished uh, CSIS uh, audience and institution that I deeply respect. And um, the name of your program, by the way, you know, is uh, clearly very cutting edge: fragility and mobility. You know, two issues that I've also grappled with a fair bit. Um, in my work, and they're definitely among the points of departure uh, for this book. 
But indeed, the lockdown is pretty interesting as well as a as sort of obviously very temporal kind of situation. And that's precisely what many people would have debated more, I think, a couple of years ago than we would now. Now we're starting to see the world coming out of the pandemic. We're seeing travel rebound, the globalization in terms of trade volumes has uh, been, been robust. Uh, the latest data, which I haven't even put into a full comprehensive sort of single PowerPoint slide yet, shows that uh, despite the lockdown, the net number of uh, international migrants has continued to rise steadily. And that would really shock many people who look at this pandemic as indeed the most coordinated lockdown in human history. And yet, even then, it technically wasn't. If you look at you know the numbers, just look, for example, at the number of countries that forged nomad visa schemes right during the pandemic. It was two countries uh, in 2019, but uh, 75 countries today that are saying, please come young people, migrants, entrepreneurs, we need you. So before I get ahead of myself, though, this book was you know, written and finished before the pandemic. And I took uh, the first you know, or some part of the lockdown period to just systematically uh, covidify it, as I like to say, and just you know, bring in where relevant. But in fact, I, I, I chose to kind of not overdo the COVID angle because the trend that the world was on in terms of the very steady increase in the number of migrants in the world and the robustness of the drivers of that migration, which I'll, I'll get into, um, we're really telling a fairly secular story, one that transcends any of the obstacles that we could throw in its path. Uh, whether it is the deglobalization thesis, the populism thesis, and the pandemic thesis, uh, if you will. So I'm happy to address each of those, but I think we should really start from the data, because in truth, the point of departure is not that the world will permanently be locked down because of one pandemic. The truth is that we've been on this mega trend wave and we will continue on that wave. And that's, you know, the, the, the strength behind the story, if you will. But the areas that I really want to focus on most just in sharing a few, um, a few initial thoughts and slides relate basically to demographics and climate. And let me focus on those and then tie them back, of course, to our situation at home uh, in, in America. So let me start with, uh, let me start by sharing my slides. And I'll jump right in here. Okay, here we are. So we've actually been in an era, you might say, of mass migration for centuries, actually, uh, but but uh, you know, with various ebbs and flows. But I'll focus on the drivers of the next wave. And ironically, I'll start really um, again not with the pandemic, but I'll start with the world's depopulation because this is actually one of the most striking facts that people are not really aware of, or at least haven't really come to grips with. Now, if we were having this conversation 10 or 15 years ago, many people would still have predicted that the world population was going to reach 14 or 15 billion people. Uh, there was talk of a global a Malthusian crisis of overpopulation and resource scarcity and so forth. But the, 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 with each passing year or a couple of years, as we've revised those projections, the number has come down, 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 down. And pre, just on the eve of the pandemic, you had the Gates Foundation putting its latest forecast at a world population peaking at about 11 billion. Now, I would go so far as to say that, that they, yet again, alongside many other demographic forecasting groups, have overshot. We've continuously overshot for decades. And um, I'll come to the role of COVID in all of this, but, but, but you know, we've tended to underestimate rate of urbanization, female empowerment, cost of living, climate consciousness, all of these factors that have driven down fertility. Um, and so as a result, I, I would go so far as to say that this peak humanity moment will come at a population at less than 10 billion people and right around potentially uh, 2040. So we're basically at peak humanity already from a chronological standpoint. And of course, much of the world already feels that way. Pretty much the entire Northern hemisphere of Earth is, is feels like it's at peak humanity already. 
overpopulation is a national and sub-regional problem, not a global problem. And, uh, and so we have to really think very differently about the stock, if you will, of uh, our numbers as a species and what that means for how we conceive of our own distribution around the world. Because among the many drivers of migration historically, and indeed certainly one of the biggest in the 20th century, was demographic imbalances, the gap between old and young. And we're now in a situation where the older populations are concentrated in, age, in aging Northern societies and younger populations are concentrated in developing countries. And rectifying that mismatch has been and will certainly continue to be a huge driver of human migration as we seek to fill those uh, labor shortages. Where the world population ultimately settles is a huge question that I know that we would love to sort of philosophize about, or you and me, you know, for, for hours, but we won't have time. But I put this book cover up on the right. This is my very good friend, uh, Christopher Tucker, who is the chairman of the American Geographical Society, uh, where I'm a trustee. And he, as you can tell from the title of the book, Planet of Three Billion, suggests that we engineer, mostly through female empowerment and education, a glide path back to the population that the world was at roughly around 1945. Uh, which was only 3 billion people. So you, you might say pre-climate change or cognizance of climate change and less concern about environmental uh, sustainability. But be that as it may, we are the number that we're at now. We're not getting much higher. Certainly our resource consumption is still uh, you know, very, very worrying. But our aggregate number of human beings in the world is more of a concern about how fast it goes down than how fast it goes up. And if you follow Elon Musk on Twitter, in addition to his jabs at Bernie Sanders, you know, you'll pick up every now and then, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, him raising this point about the global population crash being his greatest concern, uh, you know, uh, next to, you know, the timeline at which he'll colonize space. And because this has all kinds of implications, of course, for our real economy in the world today. So I'll explore a bit more what this means in terms of, again, the generational balance, the, the distribution of people, and of course, what it means for our public policy and our immigration uh, policy as well. Now, another very crucial point that's a corollary to all of this is uh, what I said before about this correction of the forecast. Um, the, 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 the prognosis, the forecasts that were made pre-pandemic obviously didn't have the benefit of taking into account the baby bust of COVID. Now that baby bust is far more severe, and it, I should say it's, it's just beginning, right? Far more severe than the baby bust of the GFC. And what's more significant than either one of them is the fact that both of them have happened within just about a decade of each other. That is demographically cataclysmic, and I don't think anyone has really fully wrapped their heads around what happens when you have two successive baby busts so close to each other, the second one being, again, far more acute. So the curve that I'm uh, I've, I've drawn in here in the dashed line gives you a sense of what might happen to generation alpha uh, if indeed the COVID correction is as severe as it's projected to be. What it will mean is that when generation alpha completes its birth cycle over the coming uh, several years, it will check in, it will clock in at smaller than Generation Z. So Generation Z will have been, will be the largest cohort of humans that our species has ever produced. And it's going to go downhill pretty rapidly from there. Something again to think about when we, when we look at generational balance and, and so forth. The world population though is still young. So now let me get into some of the key issues around um, around uh, not just population size, but generational dynamics and how they relate to mobility, because this is absolutely essential. Because um, when we talk about global demographics, so often the first word that you hear is aging. The world is aging, the world is graying. Well, hold on just a minute, because there are actually substantially more young people than there are old people in the world. Yes, if you are America or Germany or Japan, you are can be forgiven for saying the world is aging. But let's remember that 60% of the world population is still under the age of 40. And if you're looking at the future of our human society, you have to look at the geography and the behavior of young people today. So the protagonists in this book 
are really the 4.5 billion young people in the world. Because if I am setting out to answer the question, where will the humans of the future of 2030, 2040, and 2050 live? I am almost by definition looking at today's 30-year-olds, 20-year-olds, and 10-year-olds, not today's 70-year-olds, 80-year-olds, and 90-year-olds. So my bias is very explicitly on the world's young people. Now, this is crucial because, again, you have to think like a young person. And in my, my methodology, in a way, for this book, as it were, in terms of the interviewing rather than the literature, you know, I really sought out young people to understand their attitudes, right, to interview them. To what, how do Gen Z think? How do Gen Alpha think? And this is always easier when you have young children, I might add. So they became, you know, something of a subject matter experts on this. And what I've done here, though, more objectively, is to look at all of the surveys that have been done around why young people just refuse to have children today. And if you look at this, you know, again, these, we may not, if you're older, you know, sympathize with all of these, but young people have are nothing if not data driven <laughs> these days. And they seem to be saying that when you measure, you know, pound for pound, literally the emissions output from these various, uh, you know, uh, aspects of material consumption, uh, lo and behold, the worst thing you can do for the planet, they are told and convinced is to have a child. And this does impact young people's psychology, and it's clearly a driving force in, in their behavior. So I don't think that even changing the material conditions, you know, having universal basic income and things like this would necessarily impact young people's view on fertility. So, you know, countries have tried, and I've, I've surveyed pretty much every country in the world that has attempted to revive and revitalize fertility, uh, all, of course, in vain. You know, China, for example, has you know clearly recognized the excesses of its one-child policy, and then some years ago encouraged a two-child policy, which had no takers that I'm aware of, and now has even gone so far in the last couple of years to promote a three-child policy, which of course has even few takers. So China is stuck in the one-two-four dynamic of you know one young person caring for two parents and four grandparents. And so our dependency ratios are coming out of whack. Now, let me say another thing about youth. And this is really interesting. If you lined up the 8 billion people in the world, sort of left to right and said, let's look at the median human being, right? Number, you know, 4 billion. What is that person like? Now, if we take, you know, Errol, you and me, right? Here we are, um, two guys, family, a uh, couple of children, I presume, not sure. I think you have a couple of kids, right? Yeah, one. Yeah, so I've got two. Um, and we, we think that, you know, when we speak about the world and who we are and our views and attitudes, especially in academia and think tanks, there's this sort of sense of projecting our, you know, kind of uh, perspectives on the world. But the world is not actually a collection of two parent, two income, two child suburban Western households like us. It's not at all. That four billionth human being in the world is precisely the following. It is, of course, young. It's a you know median age under 40, is single, unmarried, has no children, is financially struggling, is not a homeowner, right, is renting at best, and is, of course, not in the West, but in a developing country. That's the median human being on the planet Earth. That is the person that is the protagonist of my story. That is the rump of who we are as a civilization. And therefore, that is the person that I'm putting front and center in my story, because that is 100% of the future world population, given where demographic trends, fertility trends, and socioeconomic trends are headed. And the attitudes and the values of these people are very, very different from our contemporary kind of, you know, post-war uh, civilization and values and so forth. Indeed, when you look at these surveys, and one after the other, they tell us that, A, there are less vertically loyal to the nation or to ethnic group, far more horizontally loyal to causes and generational identity. They believe that connectivity, sustainability, and mobility are the three most important values. And again, we can go to many, many sources and surveys that, that bear this out. So again, put yourself in those shoes. I'm urging you to look at the future of our humanity, the current, actually the present is the future, because if the present 
world population is majority young and they're not having children, they are also the future. The demographic of today is also the demographic of tomorrow. It's the same people just getting older, but no one is coming after them. That's what's happening. So the most sci-fi thing that I believe that you can say in the world today is the present is the future. And it's actually, unlike sci-fi, it's actually true. That's the kind of gravity of the inflection point that we are at. Now, there's still obviously a geographic distributional component that's essential in all of this. And as, as Errol mentioned, my previous book was called The Future is Asian. Part of that argument was, of course, sheer demographics. Literally more than half the human population lives in Asia, the eastern two thirds of the Eurasian land, land mass. And not only is that true in the aggregate, it's especially true of young people, because at least in Asia, you still have higher fertility than other parts of the world, China and Japan notwithstanding. Remember that India's population is now on par with China. South Asia as a whole is about 1.8 billion people far larger than China with a much younger median age and still higher fertility to say nothing of the 700 million people in Southeast Asia, which also have a young median age. So even as China's population is falling and its young population is falling, the only parts of the world with growing young populations are um, the MENA region, Africa and Asia. But remember that Asia's population is far, far, far larger than any other part of the world. So even if you are an Africa optimist or pessimist, doesn't matter. Demographically, it's not nearly as significant as Asia and obviously isn't as wealthy as Asia. If you look at the bottom chart here, just working age millennials, which is really only a quarter of the youth population of the world, is... Um, is uh, mostly coming from Asia, right? Is, is more than tenfold the number of working age millennials in Asia than you have in uh, either the US or uh, the EU. Note again, India has a larger share of that than China does and has more Gen Z as well. So if I had to actually summarize the future of human demographics, and I, you only gave me two words, the two words I would pick are Asian youth, basically. The number of Asian youth outnumbers the number of, say, Christians or Muslims or pretty much any other you know, demographic category besides gender that you can name, Asian youth. And where Asian youth stay or go in many ways determines the winners and losers of the future as our societies age. Now, let's bring it home for a moment. All of this is happening at a time when American fertility has been declining, dependency ratio is rising, the fiscal burden uh, is, is, uh, is uh, you know, uh, growing. Um, and of course, immigration has been declining as a result of a number of factors, not least uh, Trump administration policies, COVID, global competition for talent and so forth. So this is a difficult spot, you know, for the US to be in. In a way, it's riding on the pre-existing momentum and the stock of migrants that have been coming in and their higher fertility rates. But at the end of the day, you know, uh, you still need to continuously recruit or produce that next generation. And it is, uh, you know, the situation is far worse in Europe than it is in the United States, but it's certainly more avoidable in the U.S. situation uh, because the U.S. has been far more open to migrants uh, than Europe has been. So I look at the most recent census data here. I've had the opportunity to draw upon what was just published in October of last year. And again, it's quite worrying looking at the specific categories of, uh, of immigrants uh, coming in and, um, and uh, uh, you know, how those numbers have gone down. Now, I do want to sort of conclude this brief section on optimistic note, because the Biden administration is doing a lot to undo some of the Trump administration policies to overhaul and digitize uh, immigration procedures to expand the H-1B visa qu quota and quite a few other things. I really believe that, in fact, this very year, 2022, could be an absolute hockey stick in the other direction. And I really hope that it will be. Only America could go from suddenly dropping down to just, um, you know, uh, dropping down to 200,000 to shooting up back to 800,000 in a single year. If the only country in the world capable of doing it and doing it like this and absorbing that many people without people even 
noticing, and there's a whole separate policy conversation about how, you know, sometimes the best things happen when no one's paying attention. Let's not talk about this because then maybe the wrong people would notice, but yet it's the best thing that could happen, right? Um, in the same way that central bank policy making used to be kept secret, you know, um, let's not talk about this, but let's hope it happens. This is definitely going to turn around based on what the Biden administration is doing right now. You know, I mentioned at the very beginning, Errol, surprisingly, many people, wow, the stock of international migrants has continued to grow. And uh, this has been driven, you know, you, I would say one country, India, is actually really crucial in understanding the future of global demographics. I've already mentioned the Asian stock overall, India's young median age. And for a number of reasons that can be quite geopolitical, and it's worth dwelling on since, you know, this is a CSIS audience, the fact is, that whereas the Chinese diaspora today is still the largest in the world, it's concentrated mostly in the Pacific. The Indian diaspora is large and growing in the second largest, but will very soon exceed that of China and be more globally distributed than China and is again a younger demographic than China. And a lot of it has to, this has to do with China precisely because of the suspicions of China and Chinese. At the same time that it's increasingly difficult to be a Chinese student, a Chinese professional, Indians are welcome just about everywhere because they may to, uh, I suppose I'm allowed to generalize because I'm Indian. I was born in India. I'm an immigrant to every country that I've lived in since birth, um, including of course, America. But if you know speaking English, not being geopolitically suspicious, having studied engineering or math or medicine, you know the relevant necessary subjects, um, all of those actually are really strong tailwinds as Indians seek to move around the world in search of economic opportunity. And if you look, there's a lot more granular data I could show you, but basically, if you look at the number of annual emigrants out of each country in the world, um, India is about 10 times higher than the second place country. Um, so that, that's, that's really how important uh, India is, is becoming in terms of uh, kind of, you know, this sort of shifting demographic landscape. I'll get more and more into this. Now, again, let's just get back to mass migrations and some of the other and, and into the, into the uh, other factors that are driving it. A lot of people say, my goodness, you're positing a world of hundreds of millions of people, you know, moving every single year and so forth, you know, on aggregate basis, billions potentially in this century. Um, how are we ever going to cope? This is unprecedented. My first response is this is not at all unprecedented. I dare say in the past 300 years of particularly Western history, you might say that the singular arena of pol pol political or policy triumph has been mass migration. We have proven for more than 300 years that mass migration might be the one thing that human beings are best at collectively doing without collectively regulating. Because we're very bad at maintaining global peace and stability, we're terrible at maintaining economic equity, and we're horrible at managing the global commons. But for centuries, whether the push factors or the pull factors have been in the driver's seat, whether it's been tragedies like genocide and war or partitions um, or, or other factors um, or the pull factors of labor shortages. The fact is that yeah, century after century, the decimal place has been moving to the right. We have moved from millions of migrants in a century to tens of millions to hundreds of millions of migrants. And it has been absorbed, constantly absorbed. And the winning countries, as we of course know, this is a cliche for Americans, we're the ultimate winner, right? America and Canada, by far the biggest winners. So again, another one of those things, let's just go back to doing what we've done so well. Let's depoliticize it as much as possible. Let's let supply and demand shape our policy, you know, uh, immigration policy rather than politics and populism. And we'll continue to be the winners. Now, let me get into a whole other arena that's very significant, and that is uh, climate change. Now, if you begin with this base map layer, which is the present distribution of the human population, again, there's 8 billion pixels uh, on this map, and you layer in what is called the suitability change index that, that derives from forecasts of temperature rise, look closely at what happens. So this is what NASA and NOAA forecasts are showing us 
about the, the, the shifting suitability for habitation of geographies in the world for, with every one, two, three degree temperature rise. Red means, of course, becoming less suitable and green means becoming more suitable. Now, note several facts if you compare the previous map to this map. Again, the, the aging and depopulating societies of the world are those that are becoming more livable, right? That are turning green. And the places that presently are home to the majority of the world's population, especially the world's young population, are red or becoming redder and are becoming unlivable and unsuitable for human habitation. Now, I would submit to all of you, right? Let's push pause for a moment on just the kind of wonky speak. This is the most perverse moral dilemma that you could possibly imagine on the planet Earth. I can think of no more ironic and tragic reality to articulate it all in the world than this, that we have our entire demographic future of our species basically trapped behind borders in geographies that are becoming unlivable, where they are already economically unproductive. And in, meanwhile, the northern and far northern hemisphere is becoming more livable over time and is losing population as it ages. This is the world as it is and as it is becoming. And as you well know, neither COP26 nor the Biden administration nor Xi Jinping is giving us a game plan for rec to rectify this misalignment between our geography of natural resources and our geography of people and our geography of political boundaries. This is where we are. There's no sugarcoating it and there's no game plan or roadmap. And that's where, you know, I want to, this is why I'm an advocate for fairly radical thinking about where we go in terms of the future of human geography. As I mentioned, the decimal point has been shifting to the right and the drivers, let me explain now, you know, we're, we're accustomed, you know, by to looking at the last couple of centuries of history and saying, look, either it was economic drivers like, uh, you know, uh, uh, financial collapse, uh, hardship, you know, uh, in Italy or Ireland, uh, you know, or of course, again, political events like world wars and genocide and so forth, driving migration. But already today, um, if you if you can even neatly segregate the drivers of migration, climate is rising as a driver and component of the overall stock of international migrants today, but we do not have a playbook for this. We have a, the 1951 Refugee Convention, but we don't have an environmental equivalent. And this is crucial because if you imagine today, right now, for example, European governments are sending Syrians back to Syria on the logic that they were temporarily granted asylum, that Syria today is considered stable-ish, and therefore, you know, they, the governments are within right to send them back. Of course, the Syrians violently disagree. But what is your what case do you make when you have a Yemeni or, uh, you know, another uh, person of an originating, originating not just from a country that's in political crisis and collapse, but where there's no water? Can you actually send that person back to that country where there is no water? You cannot exactly say that society is livable ish. You just cannot make that ruling. So our legal um, you know, protocols are not yet uh, acclimated, you know, pardon the pun, to, to the climate uh, reality. So I'm focused heavily uh, within the, you know, we can talk about the political drivers that we're familiar with, the economic drivers and the historical factors. We're, we're all vaguely familiar with all of that. But I, I, I hinge a lot of my future argument on climate migration. Um, because it is a large and growing phenomenon that, again, we can now numerically document according to, uh, you know, various uh, data sets. So I've been devoting some of my reportage and, and, again, you know, the research that I've been doing on site in different, different countries around the world to so looking at climate migration and looking at the patterns, coastal to inland, low level to elevated, uh, so on and so forth. But again, this ties together when you look at Central American migrants in Mexico and trying to make it to the United States, African migrants to across the Mediterranean to Europe. It isn't just climate. It isn't just politics. It isn't just economics. It's all of these really tied together. And so I'm exploring these questions around what the future of sovereignty looks like. What are our future political systems going to look like? Which geographies are going to become melting pots? And how are they going to absorb these migrants and so forth? In, a, in, in terms of the radical new human cartography, really shifting us into a new, um, you know, sort of 
spatial era, uh, if you will. I even talk in the book about terraforming, you know, vast new geographies of the Siberian, you know, um, uh, Siberian terrain and Arctic tundra and so forth uh, seasonally, though. I do highlight areas in particular that I call the climate oases and the oasis zones. And in, in the book, I have chapters on each of these geographies, the Rocky Mountains, the British Isles, the Great Lakes, um, you know, Western Russia, Scandinavia, um, peninsular, upper peninsular, Southeast Asia, um, you know, the Caucasus, uh, Japan, and so on and so forth. And I kind of look at in a narrative way, what are their environmental characteristics, political, economic, cultural, their capacity? What is the capacity of the geography, in a way, to harness or to, to absorb greater populations? Um, and, you know, I came to some interesting uh, conclusions that, that really do vary place by place. Just because a geography may seem like a climate oasis in terms of its environmental characteristics, it certainly doesn't mean it is. Um, and, you know, and we can obviously talk about uh, that uh, case by case. Let me say, come bring it back to America now. And this is really, I think, one another one of those gut punches. Now, let me point out that if you were, uh, you know, looking at this previous map, you see that the U.S. is a bit more red or has a bit more emergent red zones in the South and the West. Then Europe, which is at further northern latitude, and obviously Canada. So we can say that our colleagues and partners in the in Western civilization are quite frankly more climate propitious than we are as America. And that's something we have to grapple with. So I just mentioned that the South and the West aren't looking so great. Now have a look at this chart on the right. In the past, over the past century, the two regions of America whose populations have grown as a percentage of the total American population have been the South and the West. Meanwhile, the, pro the proportion of America's population represented by the North and the, and the, and the, the, uh, the, uh, the East has shrunk. And yet climate change tells you that we should be moving in the opposite direction from what we have been moving. So we not only are in a situation where America is not blessed by, or much of America is, is uh, not blessed by climate change, but is certainly at risk from it, and yet our population movements point in the wrong direction. So we've got our, um, our work cut out for us to say nothing of the fiscal uh, you know, sort of challenges inherent in all of this when much of people's net worth is tied up in their homes, of course, and many of those homes are not located in safe assets. So, you know, when I when you I showed you that larger climate niche map, right, with uh, the the green moving northward, what climate scientists say is that for every one degree temperature rise, a billion people might be displaced. There's an American equivalent of that too, which is the displacement occurring as uh, as the current dominant demographic strongholds in America become less and less climate propitious. So I have a uh, you know, pretty strong set of recommendations on how we need to be doing our infrastructure planning uh, for this scenario. Because if you think about how our present fiscal pie is split up through pork barrel legislation and obviously local administrative priorities, that's not the way you do infrastructure planning in an age of climate change. Instead, you start with the climate models that tell you where and where will not be the livable geographies of the future. Then you think about incentivizing, nudging, if you will, migration towards more livable areas. And then you do your generations long kind of assessments around where to be investing in infrastructure. That's how I think it should be rationally done, but that's not where things are necessarily going with the infrastructure bill and the Green New Deal. But they are actually, there are some positive signs in there and FEMA and the Army Corps of Engineers and HUD are aligning behind a set of policies that are disincentivizing people from living in climate stressed areas. The courts are also getting involved. Insurance companies are getting involved. So I do think that this is again, uh, situation that can in fact be rectified. Let me start to wrap up. Apologies for, for going on so long. Um, you know, again, migration is part and parcel of what it is to be human. It is an intimate part of the definition of the human story of the past 100,000 years. And it's been accelerating, um, you know, in every century, including the, the last one and this one. 
given our demographic realities, especially our demographic contraction, migration should be seen much more as an opportunity than a challenge. In geopolitics, we have to go back almost to a 19th century mentality in which in geopolitical power formula, demographic size mattered a great deal, right? This is, um, so as I phrase it, collecting people is collecting power. And that's how we as America need to be thinking about it again. There are policy tools or norms that can, as I said before, depoliticize migration and let supply and demand be back in the driver's seat, such as the Global Compact for Migration and skills partnerships. And this is critical. And uh, Michael Clemens of the Center for Global Development down the street is to be uh, uh, strongly applauded for his very uh, you know, even-handed advocacy for these kinds of uh, programs. And, and many countries are catching on to this and engaging in them, even ones that you would not expect, like Japan, like Russia, places that we've tended to view as quite insular and, and even xenophobic. So there's a lot of promise in having a, you know, again, a technocratic approach. Final point is a macro one, again, a, a civilizational global scale one. You know, we, we've, uh, the axiom that everyone knows about geography is geography is destiny. And I've spent 20 years saying geography is not destiny. Right? Geography is what we make of it. And it's up to us to rectify that misalignment of geographies. There's nothing God given in it uh, in terms of where our borders are, where our infrastructure is, um, and where people are. You know, we can fix this. There are two things that we can do in specific. You can either move people to where resources are, or you can move technologies to where the people are who need them. And that's gonna be a critical part in determining how many people actually survive this century as our population inevitably declines. Because I know that we'd rather it be, um, you know, 6 billion uh, or 7 billion people rather than say 2 billion people. And that's, those are decisions or the, the, the answer to that question is gonna hinge on many of these uh, decisions that we face in the coming one or two decades. And we have to think about mobility as a human right the way the Gen Z and Gen Alpha uh, people do. That's not to say a borderless world. You'll, you won't hear me use that word uh, you know, without significant qualifiers uh, because I'm a political geographer and I recognize more clearly than anyone that the world has more borders today than it's ever had. And it's uh, evidently, as, early as you and I will discuss, perhaps about to have a couple of new ones. Um, but that doesn't mean that mobility can't be seen as a right and that it can't be distinguished from nationality based on one's qualifications and so forth. And, and so that people can be less penalized for their country of birth. And of course, we need to think collectively about environmental stewardship. And we need to think about using our present technologies to achieve this redistribution with minimal ecological footprint. I didn't go too much into those solutions right now, but I will say that that's an extremely long laundry list because on the positive side, we have every technology available today to feed the world and redistribute the world and have greater mobility with a very, very light environmental footprint. So uh, that doesn't make me a, you know, a woolly technological optimist, uh, but it does mean that, that uh, we, can, we can do this if we step back from today's narrow political calculus and look at the big picture as I've tried to present uh, just now. So thank you again so much, Errol, my friend. Look forward to our conversation. Yeah, th thanks, Prague. And if, if that wasn't encouragement enough for folks to go out and buy the book, I, I don't know what is. But uh, I have to say, Prague, I was shocked to learn that the median person is not a DC-based white guy with two kids <laughs> that works at a think tank. Uh, I mean, just utter uh, shocking. I also... Um, I liked how you you incorporated the um, conversation about climate change in the United States. In your book, you actually get most into climate change. Uh, it, it's it's a theme throughout the book, but you really start to hammer it when when you get to the chapter on the United States. And I was actually reading that chapter when this Nature Climate Change paper came out last week on the mega drought, and it was it was. Quite strange, actually, because there was the word mega drought in your book. And then, you know, we actually had the, the research paper to end all research papers on what the mega drought was come out uh, from these scientists. So what I, I have two buckets of questions for you. One is I'm glad you spent so much of your time talking about youth. Um, I want to dig a little bit on the on the your thoughts on populism and nationalism, because I think those go part and parcel with your analysis of youth. I also want to talk uh, before that 
about um, forced migration, you alluded to the fact that um, Vladimir Putin yesterday uh, recognized the two breakaway regions of eastern Ukraine. Uh, as we are coming to you, news is breaking all over about shelling and, and certain um, that an invasion might be imminent or might even be happening uh, as we speak. And so talk to us a little bit. You, you mentioned the 1951 Refugee Convention and how it doesn't cover climate migrants, but, but talk about a little bit about that forced migration element of, of your analysis. How does that play into to this vision of the world um, in the future that you've painted? Absolutely. So a couple of thematic and then and geographic responses. First of all, forced migration by, you know, again, range of estimates accounts for, um, you know, not quite a fifth, but, you know, a very significant percentage of the total number of migrants in the world today. There's 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 some excellent but, you know, painful literature out there around um, the, the categories of forced migrants, bonded servitude, indentured servitude, slavery still, um, obviously particularly affecting females, one has to emphasize that, and even children. And so that as an aggregate remains one of the great, you know, sort of maladies, uh, you know, in, in the world today. And uh, one hopes that you know, getting greater transparency and digital identification and other kinds of uh, instruments. And of course, supply chain related scrutiny can help to, to bring down that number. That's one thing. Uh, the other is just, again, political. And so we obviously, whether it is uh, Yemen or South Sudan or uh, Syria, Afghanistan now as well, um, you know, we continuously have uh, these these refugee situations stemming from from state collapse or from international conflict, such as what is now uh, brewing uh, between Russia and Ukraine. That's part of the weaponization of migration as well, of course, because we see that even it's a false flag forced migration uh, operation that's being used almost as a pretense, one of the pretenses, you might say, for this particular Russian incursion. Part of it, though, let me also say, and this is uh, by no means, um, you know, uh, I'm hardly making excuses for Russia, but one explanatory point that's interesting is simply that of the stock and flow of migrants in, in the post uh, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, as it were, actually the largest number of intra-regional migrants in the world remains people within the former Soviet Union. It's so in other words, Asians within Asia, Africans within Africa, Europeans within Europe, uh, people in Latin America within Latin America, take all of those, the number of people just moving within the boundaries or across the boundaries of the former Soviet Union is larger than those other regions. So there is a constant constant resettling of peoples in grappling with the aftermath and the new economic realities of life in the former Soviet republics over the past 30 years. That is not necessarily related to violence, however. And, and so this is going to be a major case, uh, you know, on a larger scale than Georgia was, I think, in 2008. But we already saw late last year in winter uh, with, you know, um, forced migration, out of uh, uh, Central Asia, well, out of Afghanistan and, and Arab countries through Russia being trafficked to the Lithuanian border. Uh, so that another, other, you know, yet more examples. That was only in the thousands though. And this is going to be significantly larger what's happening here. So again, any place in the world you look, we still have, you know, weaponization of migration, forced migration as a, as a factor. Uh, but I do, have I mean I'm a utilitarian at, at heart, so I you know I, I look at these cases to some degree by the number of people displaced in each particular context. You know when I think about how we need to prioritize our you know humanitarian responses and the volumes of aid you know that are that are sent to to grapple with these situations. So Venezuela, for example, is still you know numerically perhaps the the, the single greatest you know shock. Of a, of, a, of a sort of forced migration or, or, or even, uh, you know, sort of involuntary migration, state collapse kind of tragedy. Afghanistan is up there as well, Syria, uh, Yemen, and so forth. And, and I don't think Ukraine by the numbers is going to be as big, but of course it still, you know, is, is capturing our headlines today, rightly. Your, your book makes perhaps the clearest depiction I've seen of how demographic and human mobility patterns intersect with the demise of populism. 
Um, and, and I would say specifically the demise of populist politicians. Um, it also discusses how young people support globalization and are becoming global citizens. Uh, you spend a lot of time talking about that, despite, you know, when we when we read the news and, and, and think about it, um, there's seemingly endless waves of, of nationalism and populism. But despite that, you, you point out this trend that you're seeing. And, you know, those of us in the United States are increasingly needing to reckon with competing identities uh, in order to determine the future of, of what our democracy is going to look like. So does this, does the cohesive nation state identity or, or, or uh, nation state based identity, is that a thing or are we increasingly moving towards something that's, that's post that nation state? Mm -hmm. You know, this is definitely an evolutionary question, and each society is at a different stage along the continuum. You might even, and I dare say, I do view it as almost a teleological kind of process. And therefore, you know, populism should be rightly seen as what it is, which is just a cyclical blip. And despite waves of populism, and we've had anti immigrant populist waves at many points over the 20th century and now in the 21st century. And we wouldn't be where we are in terms of the demographic diversity of America if those uh, populist blips really were the significant long-term driver policy. They're obviously not. And Trump was no different, as it, as it were. Again, that same census that came out in October of last year showed that right under Trump's nose, America became more diverse, more mixed race, more Latino. So in the end, you know, uh, it, your sort of migration always wins. Uh, you know, intermarriage as as uh, is, is is growing in pretty much every Western country. Um, countries that we've thought of as being very wedded to the idea of national identity in the nation state, birthright citizenship, and so forth, like Western European countries, have relaxed those laws as their populations have become irreversibly. Um, you know, diluted. Uh, and if you look at the new German government, it's so interesting because this is a country that let in more than a million asylum seekers and refugees in 2015 to 2016. Then you had a far right movement uh, ascendant and it just got wiped out in the most recent election. And a center left coalition is at the helm with a very pro-immigration policy. And it's making it easier and easier for foreigners to acquire German nationality. Uh, after just a couple of, you know, three, four years in Germany, you can more or less apply for citizenship now. It almost looks like America <laughs> decades ago. And this is not the kind of stuff you would expect. So again, populism should be treated like a blip. The evolution towards multi-ethnic uh, states and, you know, if not melting pots is in fact the norm. You see it far more at the urban level and among youth than at the suburban or rural levels of, 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 amongst the elderly. But again, these are not equivalent demographic power centers because the old people will be gone and the young people will still be there. So only if young people were to have a massive change of heart right, would you expect uh, that this trend would reverse? And then again, even if you did have a temporary reversal, that wouldn't be unprecedented. We've had them before, but guess what? In the end, my mass migration literally always wins. And just one other thing, I spent some time on this in the book, I looked at conscription. And this is, um, I think, the most damning, the most damning evidence that never gets cited by those who rhetorically say that we're in an age of resurgent populism, nationalism, civilizational states. And I say, really? Why don't we look at the countries that have conscription policies? Let's look at Russia. Let's look at Turkey. Let's look at those strongman, nationalist-driven states that we identify as you know, being at the, at the forefront of this trend. Well, lo and behold, and I had, you know, I laughed my head off, quite frankly, the more data and stories I collected. These are precisely the countries where every single 18 year old male, their right of passage is to save up enough money to bribe their way out of conscription and get out of the country. So nationalism, what? Find me an 18 year old who wants to, in Russia, who wants to go to the front lines in Ukraine right now. Right. I doubt it. Right. But I know that the first hundred thousand rubles that he saves up is to get out. 
right? And that's your true nationalism, right? That's your, you know, that, so young people, uh, again, generational divides are so crucial when we do this research. The younger you look, the less you see the civilizational state and the more you see opportunism. It was one of the things that I really appreciated about your book is this, this, it's not a focus on the ping pong back and forth between Trump and Biden and Obama and, and, you know, populism versus nationalism versus not it's, it looks at the arcs and it tries to, to use uh, data over the course of, of a longer period of time and look at underlying things like conscription. I mean, not only the examples that you made, but you also talked about how when conscription goes away, a very useful data point is nobody volunteers for, for the armed forces. Um, which I uh, have some personal experience with that I won't go into here, but I think that that's that's a really, really interesting point. I I wanna ask you, the last question that I wanna ask you is about the the tone of the book. And so one of the things that I really liked about this, in addition to the arc point that I just made is, your book is about human mobility, but it's also about much more than the mobility of humans. Uh, it goes into populism and nationalism, as we've talked about. We didn't talk about technology um, and, and job market competitiveness, but it really goes deep on that. Um, and really so much more. It's, it's, you know, when presented as it is in the book, it's clear why those things are in there. But you talk about it in, in a much more accessible way than I think those of us who sort of live and breathe the migration stuff every day. So it's, it's certainly, I look forward to your next book on climate migration. Um, I don't know if that decision has been made or not, but uh, by the way you were talking, I was like, that ah, could be the, the next one. Um, but uh, look, ultimately, I, I, I really enjoyed the, the positivity and the, and the you know, it's, it's, a, it's a clear-eyed positivity. It's a database. You know, you're not painting this uh, rosy, you know, rainbows and unicorns version of the world. But, but I, you know, while the future does seem uncertain, you, you seem to imply that we do have agency over that future. And so perhaps with things like strategic planning and, and implementation, you seem optimistic that we can secure the, the future that we want, or at least we can move in that direction. So if you had a, a, a short, you know, let's say a tweet length uh, message for our, for our audience to take away from this conversation, you mentioned Asian youth being the two word version of this, um, but what, what would you like to leave um, uh, our audience with uh, at, at the very end? Well, maybe we could go back to one of those tweet length kind of bumper stickers I mentioned earlier. And, I, and the, the, it was the following phrase, collecting people is collecting power. Mm. And you may not appreciate it right now because America still has a lot of people. But demographics is one of these things where you, if you haven't calculated it right, suddenly it'll fall off a cliff. So we need to all just be cognizant and aware and be rapidly pro-immigration. And let me be clear from the COVID, the COVID experience should have taught all of us that no amount of labor automation is going to compensate for the, the jobs that we do for each other. Right. And we're we're not going to achieve that level of automation as, as quickly as we thought. We have shortages of truckers, of farm workers, of nurses, of caregivers, all of the essential human tasks that we do for each other. It's costing us lives. You know, excess mortality could have been prevented with better, more widely distributed nursing care. Um, and so many other of our maladies in, in, in the country can be overcome by actually having um, you know, a, a, a more active services economy. And services economies are based around people. So as much as I'm a technological optimist and I see a lot more automation coming, let those jobs be automated of which there are fewer and fewer. But let's not forget that things that we actually do for each other are higher value services for which we actually still need to train and import people alike, both at the same time. So collecting people is collecting power. And, uh, you know, it's a decision. It, again, agency. We have the agency to recognize this, understand the logic, see the, the rationale, and to get behind that wherever we fall on the political spectrum on other issues. Dr. Praghana, thank you, my friend. This was 
Very, very interesting. I hope everyone goes out and picks up a copy of your book. Uh, I look forward to the next one. We'll have you on again uh, to, to do another discussion. And I look forward to hopefully seeing you in Singapore in, uh, in a few weeks. That's right. Thank you so much. That was a great discussion. All right. Thanks to everyone for joining. We'll see you uh, next time uh, at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Have a good day.